Parks, and I'm the Executive Director of Skiing Wild Conservation Trust. And I've been working on salmon, uh, salmon conservation, salmon issues for about 20 years in the region. And for the past 13 years, I've been uh, working for Skiing Wild Conservation Trust in this role. And in that time, I've, I've participated in the annual um, fish planning that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans puts on each uh, winter and spring. And uh, I've been involved in supporting a lot of uh, different research and uh, included in that is researching climate change impacts on, on skiing of salmon, but also habitat, fishing, uh, other, other types of impacts. Um, so I just wanted to say that this, what I'm going to be presenting tonight is the best information that I have available at this time. And it doesn't mean that things won't change in terms of, for example, management could, there, the management actions could change before the season starts, but um, it's the best, uh, my best, the best information we have from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and most of it will probably be implemented this coming season. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, I don't, even though I know a lot about salmon and, and what's going on, I, I don't know, I certainly don't know everything. And, um, you know, they're complex creatures that have incredibly uh, diverse lifespans and have, are impacted throughout a massive range from in the rivers and lakes all the way out into the North Pacific. Some go uh, as far over as off the coast of Russia. So um, they can be impacted anywhere along their journey. And so with that, I would like to um, start by talking a bit about uh, what we've been seeing in recent years and some of the reasons behind that. So recent returns have been uh, generally low for most species in recent years. And we've also been seeing much more variability year to year. Um, and also generally a smaller size of the fish that are returning. On average, their, their size is a bit smaller. And the main reasons for this are uh, poor ocean conditions, challenging freshwater conditions. And I'll talk more about both of those things. And also uh, our fisheries in off the North Coast, especially our, our commercial fisheries have been cut back a lot. Um, but there are significant fisheries in uh, Southeast Alaska that can have significant impacts on our salmon. And for some species like pink and chum salmon, we don't, and steelhead, we don't, we don't know how many uh, Canadian mass and skeena chum that Alaskans are catching in their fisheries. We don't have that information. We're hoping that advances in genetics will uh, get us Im improved information in future years, but uh, some of, some of their, the impacts from those fisheries are unknown. So in terms of ocean conditions, uh, this is a map of the North Pacific. If you look here, this is a little spot here is Haida Gwaii, Prince Rupert's right around here. Uh, this is Alaska, Vancouver's down here, Vancouver Island. And when our fish come out of the Skeena, Nass, and other North Coast rivers, they come, come out, spend some time in the estuaries, and then they head up along the coast of Alaska and out, in, out south of the Aleutian Islands. And this is where they spend time, whoops, feeding. And this map is a sea surface temperature map. And what it shows is between 2013 and 2016, we had uh, warmer than normal temperatures out in the North Pacific. So on average, about three degrees above normal. And this impacts uh, food and predators and other things, which I'll, I'll explain a bit more about. So that lasted for about three years and was nicknamed the blob by scientists. And then in, in 2017, we started to see the North Pacific Ocean cool off a bit and return to more of what was normal. And some investigations found that actually the water, the warm water, uh, instead of being at the surface, it subsided and it was at depth about 300 feet down. Um, so it, 
it didn't necessarily just go away. Um, and then in 2019, we saw the warm water return in full force in the North Pacific. And this is the most recent uh, sea surface temperature map. Uh, this is from April, the month of April. And you can see the warm water up in the North Pacific is still there. And our salmon species spend anywhere from one to uh, four years out here in the, in the North Pacific feeding. And so they're really impacted by the conditions out here. And what warm water does is it changes the food supply. And so you can see these large uh, shrimp-like creatures, they're called zooplankton, and they're little tiny shrimp. And they're what our salmon eat, and they're also what the fish our salmon eat also eat. So they're the basis of the food chain out in the, out in the Pacific Ocean. And when we, get the, when we get normal cold water out there, uh, we usually have these large species of zooplankton with lots of fat in them. And you can see this kind of gold color is fat content in, the, in these zooplankton. Well, in recent years with this warm water, we've had more southern species out there. And as you can see, they're a lot smaller and have a lot less fat in them. So what that means is just a lot less food available for the salmon out in the North Pacific when they're feeding. So that of course can have a significant impact on the abundance and health of the fish that are returning, will be returning this year because in recent years it's been fairly warm out there with um, less food. Another thing that, that also uh, makes this problem worse is currently re releasing collectively between uh, Russia, Japan, Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, we release about over 5 billion young salmon into the ocean every year. And this now accounts for about 40% of the salmon going into the ocean. And in recent years with this warm water and low food supply out there, it means that uh, they're competing more and more with our wild salmon for food. And there's uh, a lot of new uh, scientific information studies coming out which suggest that uh, they're actually having significant impacts on our wild salmon. And the hatchery fish are mostly uh, pink and chum salmon. So continuing over to the freshwater side, this is a, a map from the province of British Columbia River Forecast Center, and it shows the snowpack. Uh, this is the Skeena Nass area here. Uh, in, as of June 15, 2019, so almost a year ago, we had uh, really low snow conditions here. And so last year, as of June 15th, it was 16% of normal. And why this is important is because that snowpack, when you look at it in late spring, that's the snowpack that will feed our rivers into the summer and early fall. And so if there's really low snowpack, if we have a dry summer, then that can be, uh, create really harsh conditions for our salmon, low water, warm water, which uh, can cause a lot of different challenges. And we had uh, a lot of low snowpack years recently, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. This, uh, this year, it's better as of, I think, June or May 15th. I looked at the record a couple days ago, and we're sitting at about 83% right now. But the low snowpack in recent years would have impacted the, the young salmon that were living in the rivers that went out to the ocean, and, and some of which will be returning this year. And of course, you know, this low snowpack, but also uh, some hot, dry summers recently, has led to low river flows in August and September, and even into as far into uh, into November. Um, I think it was last year. We had really uh, drought level four drought conditions all the way into no early November, which is unheard of. Um, so this this can have impacts on the returning adults and also the young salmon. Here's a a photo that a local took of salmon that got stranded in the side channel of the Skeena and and perish. We also, in, in, in some years, we've been getting uh, significant flooding in the fall. This is a major rain event. There are actually two of them in 2017 in the fall. 
And uh, these happened just after a lot of our salmon had spawned, had laid their eggs in the gravel. And what this does, when you get this much water flow coming down, it can move that gravel around and flush those eggs out of the gravel. So uh, it also can uh, cover over the gravel with sediment and, and choke out those eggs. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a significant concern as well. So we've had challenges in both the the freshwater and the ocean for our our salmon in recent years. So what I want to talk about next is how we estimate how many fish will return. And um, so I'm going to talk about who does them, why, and how accurate they are. And so the Department of Fisheries and Oceans does most of them. Uh, the biology, the biologists out of um, Prince Rupert their staff there, they do a lot of the estimates um, for Chinook and Coho and uh, Sockeye. The Nishka Fisheries Program does estimates for the Nass River. And so the, the reason they do this is to try to plan fisheries for the coming season and get, a, get an estimate of how, how many fish we might expect. And there's been growing challenges with these and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So how they come up with these estimates is they look at, one of the things they look at is, is the adults, the parents. So for example, for sockeye, four and five years ago, the fish that will be returning this year, four and five years ago, they were deposited as eggs into the gravel by their parents. And so, you know, if you have good numbers of sockeye returning four or five years ago, that's an indication that the run could be healthy this year. Um, if there were really few sockeye salmon returning four or five years ago, then that indicates that not very many legs were, eggs were laid in the gravel and likely uh, few, a lower return. So the other, another method they use is they look at the, the jacks, what are called jacks. These are these young, these are small fish, the, these are Jack Chinook here in this picture. And they return after only one year in the ocean. Uh, they're quite small, but they actually do uh, spawn. They kind of sneak in and try to spawn with, with females. That's their strategy. Uh, but if we get lots of Jacks coming back last year, then that gives us an indication that the conditions are may be favorable for these guys' brothers and sisters, which will be the bigger ones returning this year. Um, so that's another, jacks are another thing that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans looks at uh, to try to come up with forecasts. And then another, another way in recent years that, that's proven relatively effective at times is just looking at, well, what happened last year? And because the conditions have been uh, similar or, or, and challenging for the last few years, uh, it might, that gives us some indication of what might come back this year. So, but as I, as I mentioned, these sorts of forecasts are becoming much more challenging and that's because of the environmental conditions I talked about early on. They're fluctuating a lot, changing a lot year to year in both the freshwater and the estuary and out in the ocean. And in the past, we had much more stable uh, conditions in both the ocean and freshwater, which uh, made it easier to predict the returns coming in coming up in the in the coming season uh, well this is this has just gotten much more difficult in recent years uh, because of these changes up in the environment and this is just an example last year they the department of fisheries and oceans forecast 4.8 million sockeye into the uh, fraser river but only uh, 628,000 showed up so significantly lower than than what they thought were going to come back they're, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Canadian government and other governments are putting more money into looking at what's going on out in the ocean doing research. This is a, a picture of a, a fisheries vessel, uh, a, a team of sci international scientists led by the Department of Fisheries, fisheries and Oceans. And they're in, re in the last few years, they've been doing troll surveys out in the open Pacific in late winter to try to see and try to get a better understanding on the health of the, the fish. This year they actually found quite a few more sockeye 
and pink salmon than they expected, which fingers crossed may be a good sign, but the ocean is a big place, so it's, it's a bit difficult to tell. Uh, but they are putting more money into research in the ocean to try to get a better handle on what's going on with our, our salmon. So next I'm gonna talk about what the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is forecasting and for this coming season. And, and the, ones, the information for the NAS is, comes from Nishka, the Nishka Fisheries Scientists. So in general, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is expecting low returns this season. But as, as I was talking about, there's a lot of uncertainty in this and things could fluctuate a lot. Um, so for sockeye, for Skeena sockeye, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans is estimating 875,000 uh, Skeena sockeye to return this year. And, but the long-term average is around two to three million. Uh, so their forecast is significantly less than what we would normally see. For the NAS, Nishka Fisheries is estimating about 386,000 sockeye. Uh, the long-term average is six to 700,000. So it's, uh, it's significantly lower than, than the longer term average. Uh, I will point out that these are what they call midpoint estimates. So when they do forecast, they give a range from low to high, and uh, they're usually fairly confident that the return will be somewhere in there. Um, and this is just the midpoint in that estimate. So for example, the Skeena 875,000, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it may have ranged, I think it ranged from something like four or 500,000 all the way up to 1.7 million or something. So. So they estimate a, a fairly wide range typically because there is a lot of uncertainty in these forecasts. Uh, the next species is Chinook that I'll talk about. Uh, generally, Department of Fisheries and Oceans is expecting poor returns to the north and central coast, kind of similar to last year. Uh, for the Skeena specifically, they're estimating about 39,000 return. And this is a bit better than last year. There are somewhere around 30,000 return last year. So uh, a bit better. So that's, that's good, but it's still a lot lower than the long-term average, which was, you know, in years past, uh, a more normal run would have been 80 to 120,000 Chinook into the Skeena. Uh, for Nash Chinook, they're estimating 23,000. And this is uh, in line with what the long-term average is of, you know, 20 to 30,000. So for coho, uh, last, the last year, last two years, they've, they've seen low um, ocean survival and the returns have been relatively low on the North Coast, although the NAS has been, has been all right. Last year we had an average return, um, so it's not all bad news. Uh, and there were still okay numbers in some, in some systems of, of coho on the north coast. There's a low return expected for 2020, but again, there's a lot of uncertainty in these forecasts. For pink salmon, uh, average to low returns are expected. Uh, they do have some additional uh, information in southeast Alaska. Uh, they do juvenile surveys off the coast, and in southeast Alaska, they're expecting low returns. So that could give us some indication of what we might expect here. For chum salmon, uh, for the Nass and Skeena, they have, chum salmon have been really depressed for a long time, for several decades. And there's been a lot of effort to try to protect and rebuild those fish. Um, and we're expecting low returns uh, again for most of the North Coast in, in this coming season. Uh, so we could be surprised, you know, for example, the Kitimat has some uh, both sport fisheries and uh, commercial fisheries for chum salmon and, you know, they could get a decent return. Uh, we really won't know till in season, but um, yeah, generally things have been a bit tough for chum in many systems. And for steelhead, uh, they're generally, they've generally been doing okay in recent years. We had a really good return a couple of years ago and then a kind of a low return last year. 
but generally they've been doing all right. And uh, we, the provincial government manages steelhead, uh, but they don't do uh, any forecasts for, for steelhead. I think it's just too difficult to try to estimate preseason with the information we have. And also steelhead have really complicated life histories, uh, meaning there's lots of age classes. So this year there could be, there'll be two, three, four, five year olds returning and uh, it makes it more challenging to get an understanding of, of for forecasting. So next I wanna talk about possible management actions for this coming season. And uh, the fisheries planning season starts in January each year and, and it ends in late April. And uh, DFO has stated that we can see similar, we will likely see some similar management actions as we saw last year in terms of different fisheries. Uh, I'll talk more about the specifics here. Um, so the, what I'm, what the information I'm giving here is the best indication we have from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at this time, uh, but this, the, this could change. They don't actually finalize and sign off the, uh, in, integrated fisheries management plan until sometime in June typically. So we won't know for sure until June, hopefully by mid June we'll know for sure. So um, generally reductions in Chinook commercial troll fisheries, reductions in saltwater sport fisheries and some restrictions in, in Skeena River sport fisheries. And these are the specifics that DF Department of Fisheries and Oceans has given us or where they're most likely, what they're most likely going to do. So for Skeena River recreational fisheries, uh, they're probably going to close it from May 1st until July 15th, and then open the Skeena River for sport fishing on July 15th for all the normal species. Uh, it's likely that the tributaries will be closed. Uh, I did request some information on specifics on this, but I haven't received any uh, information from DFO as of yet. So tributaries meaning uh, the rivers that flow into the Skeener like the Kalem, the Copper, the Kispiox, for example. For the Prince Rupert Area Recreational Ocean Fishery, so that's air, DFO areas three, four, five, ranges from just north of Hartley Bay all the way to the Alaska border, uh, minus Haida Gwaii. Uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is, is likely to implement reduced Chinook retention, uh, one per day, uh, two in possession from June 1st to July 31st this year. And that's down from, typically it's open for two per day and four in possession. For the Haida Gwaii recreational fishery, uh, they're proposing to reduce Chinook retention to one per day and two in possession from June 10th to June 30th. And again, normally it would be two per day, two Chinook per day, and, and four in possession. Uh, north Coast, the Haida Gwaii, the commercial troll fishery that mostly takes place off Haida Gwaii, uh, they're probably not going to open the troll fishery until after August 1st, first to try to reduce impacts on Chinook and coho salmon. And for gillnet and seine fisheries that take place on the north coast, uh, there will be a mandatory release in, of Chinook and coho salmon unless uh, good numbers of Chinook and coho show, show up this, this coming season. So moving on to sockeye, uh, it's likely that there will not be any commercial fisheries for Skeena sockeye this year. Uh, the current forecast is 875,000 and the trigger is 1.05 million. So if in season, the tide test fishery is showing us that 1.05 million fish are coming through or, or the estimate is that they are coming through, then that would trigger a commercial fishery if it exceeds that. Uh, they are expecting a modest commercial fishery for Nass sockeye uh, starting late June or July 1st. Uh, there's unlikely to be a sport fishery for Skeena sockeye, but if the run exceeds 800,000, that triggers an opening for sport fisheries for sockeye in the Skeena River. 
Uh, for coho salmon, there's likely to be reductions in commercial troll fisheries. I, the later opening I talked about in the North Coast troll fishery, likely after August 1st. Um, and then uh, likely non-retention in commercial net fisheries, as I mentioned. So they would have to release them back to the water when they catch them in their nets and gill net and same fisheries. For pink salmon, uh, there may be some opportunities for commercial pink fisheries, but the returns are uncertain. So they'll be assessing these, the strength of the run in season and basing fisheries on that. Um, so we don't know, there could be, you know, pink fisheries uh, in area six, that's kind of out by Hartley Bay. Uh, Princess Royal Island or up in area three at the mouth of the Nass and potentially even the mouth of the Skeena. Uh, no sport fishery closures are expected for pink salmon. And so I just wanted to give you a bit of information on what Skeena Wild Conservation Trust is doing in relation to these issues and salmon management. And so uh, we've been doing public education on salmon and climate change, so putting out videos, these webinars, uh, we'll be having a climate change salmon one in a couple weeks, and then our, the one showcasing uh, our biologist research in a couple of, in mid-June, so uh, we'll, Julia will give you more information on that. Uh, we've also been working with Indigenous partners on developing and implementing rebuilding plans for weak sockeye populations. We've been participating in the Pacific Salmon Commission to, in an effort to reduce Alaskan interception of our salmon. And we've had some success there, but there's a lot more work to do. Uh, we've been providing advice on the annual fishing plans to DFO. We've been supporting selective fisheries that protect wheat populations. Uh, protecting critical salmon habitats, that's a big chunk of our work, is, is habitat protection work. And, and uh, we've also been doing a lot of work on improving science, monitoring, and decision-making generally. So, and then importantly, uh, if I give you guys a few things of, of some thoughts on, on what you can do uh, to contribute. And the first one, and I think this is really important, is be, being active. Um, so just understanding what's happening in season and adapting your, fishing to try to target the stronger populations and uh, yeah, just simply under, get, get better educated on, on what's happening in season. I'll give you some resources to do that next. But I think that's something we can all do is try to harvest uh, the stronger runs and populations, shape our fisheries in that way. Uh, use your voice. This is really important. Share information, talk with your friends and neighbors. You can, we'll be, we're recording this session so you can share that with your with people you know uh, we also put information on facebook regularly so you can share that around as well uh, and then support conservation efforts and you can do that obviously by donating money there's lots of different groups that are doing good work including skin wild um, and you can get involved with with groups in in your community and there's lots of great community groups in the region so more information this is a, a link to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans webinar that they put on uh, a few months ago. And it's looking at the forecasts for the whole of British Columbia for this coming season. And also looking at the environmental conditions that, that our salmon have been experiencing over the past several years. And this is, I think it's about an hour long, but it's, if you're interested, it's well worth uh, looking at this. Uh, it's great information. Also, before the season starts, uh, the information I've been giving you on likely management actions and fisheries is preliminary. So it's important that you, uh, you go to the DFO page, just type in DFO fisheries notices, and you can look up the different fisheries like Skeena River, Sport Fishery or whatever, and uh, it will tell you uh, what is actually open and closed. So that's really important. Another great source of information is the Skeena Thai test fishery. So this is the test fishing boat at the mouth of the Skeena. They, if you click on this link here, you can, you can find uh, tables and graphs of what's returning each day for the different species and you can compare it to historical numbers as of that date that you're looking at. So that's really handy 
great information source. You just type in Skeena Tidy Test Fishery and this will come up. Uh, we've also developed a fishing fisheries app, which gives a bunch of different information. And uh, unfortunately, it's only available for, for iPhones, but um, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of different information, including these graphs here. And this is a graph of the Thai test fishing information. So it shows you, this is an example from last year for Chinook, and it shows you the 10 year average in red, uh, the 2018, so this is the prior year, what the run was. Uh, this is last year's numbers, so it tracks as, as you go through the summer. You can look at it and it'll help the, it'll keep building until the end of the season. And this is the light blue is the lowest on record. So you can compare what you're seeing to uh, the lowest on record, the 10 year average in the previous years. And, and this is for each, each species. And then finally, uh, our Facebook page, we put up information on a regular basis. So if you just like us on Facebook, you'll show this, this, this information will come up. And, you know, we put out videos and all sorts of different information on research and what's going on. And this season, we're going to be uh, doing updates in season. So short videos that update folks on what we're seeing come back in season. And that's, that's it. So sorry, I may have taken a little bit longer than the 20 minutes, but uh, yeah, we'll open up to questions. Then. Thanks, Greg. Uh, not a great outlook, but uh, hopefully, you know, if we all have a better understanding of we, what we can do as anglers, um, you know, to ensure uh, there's their ability to thrive, um, we'll start to see some improved uh, outlooks. So uh, let's start with some questions here. Um, just a, a comment or a question from Dawn here in the chat. Uh, complete abstention from angling for freshwater anglers again in Skeena while the saltwater angling continues. Also the release of coho and Chinook from commercial nets is meaningless in terms of conservation. Unmonitored and unenforced and known to result in huge mortality. So you may want to uh, Address that question and also a question coming uh, Here from Nita and Ryan back um, wondering has the annual retention changed for Chinook in the ocean. So connected to uh, Dawn's comment here. Maybe you can touch on those and uh, feel free to have more questions roll in here folks and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, uh, I think the first part was a was a comment, but the other part I will, you know, in terms of survivability and releases from uh, commercial fisheries, uh, the the survivability can be quite high out of sane fisheries. Um, with gillnet fisheries, the mortality is higher, um, so you know, up, upwards of fifty plus percent uh, for some species and. Uh, so it is a concern and it needs to be taken into the accounting so we understand how many fish are actually being impacted. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the questions, next question is around, has the annual retention changed for Chinook in the ocean? And uh, yes, so maybe I'll just back up here a little bit um, to show you the specifics so I make sure I get it right. But here you see on this, on this table. Uh, so this is the ocean I think you're talking about for recreational fisheries and this is areas three, four, five. So that's just north of Hartley Bay all the way up the coast, you know, Prince Rupert all the way the, the mouth of the Nass to the Alaska border. And so the, the most likely scenario is that it will be reduced from normally it's two per day in the ocean and it will be reduced to only one per day to possession. And that'll be Ju June 1st to July 31st, so two month period. Outside of that period, it would be normal retentions of two per day and four in possession. So that's, that's what DFO is saying, that they're likely going to implement this, this season. Great. Um, um, another uh, question here. How do you, the gillnet and seine releases work for the two species you mentioned as a commercial operation that's, that strikes me as a tough thing to actually adhere to? And a similar question. Um, uh, okay, can you just give me, sorry, Julia, can you give me ahead. one at a time just because 
Yeah. I just wanted to follow up. This. There's a follow-up question from Nita Back. What about the total? It used to be 30. That's right. I didn't include that. Uh, they did reduce that last year. Uh, it used to be 30 Chinook for recreational anglers in the ocean, and now it's 10. And it's it's it'll continue to be 10. It's it's staying at 10 for the for the year for recreational anglers coast wide. So so sorry. What was the what was the next one? Um, how do the gillnet and seine releases work for the two species you mentioned? As a commercial operation, that strikes me as a, as a tough thing to actually adhere to. Uh, how does it work? Well, they, in the seine fisheries, they do with what they call brailing. So they, they dip in a smaller basket so that they can take out a manageable amount of fish at a time, say 20 or, or so, and sort them. Um, and then in gillnet fisheries, they're supposed to fish that aren't, aren't doing so well, they're supposed to put into a revival box, uh, run water through to revive them, and also release, or if they're in decent shape, release them right away. So, you know, you, I think part of, the, part of the comment is maybe also regarding uh, monitoring. So that if, if the handling's good and they do everything right, uh, that means better survivals, and but if they don't, then then of course that means lower survivals, and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's definitely a concern, and uh, it needs to be needs to be part of the. It, it is part of the. It's something that we've been pushing for in terms of uh, making sure we're counting the likely uh, mortality rates from those releases, and it's becoming more common practice in different fisheries. Okay. It's, and it's not only in the uh, commercial fisheries, it's in all fisheries, including recreational fisheries. Uh, even Chinook that are released from rod and reel have, um, you know, some of them die, right? So, okay. uh, We've got a few more questions to get to here. Um, so uh, Noel Richard uh, asks two questions here. What dates do the Seine and Gill commercial fisheries plan on opening is the first question. Uh, so maybe go ahead and answer that one. That should be an easy yeah, so, so for it's unlikely that there'll be any openings for Skeena. Well, there, there won't be any uh, Skeena Chinook gillnet openings this year. That's a small opening typically in late June. So that won't happen as far as I understand. Uh, and due to the low numbers, there probably won't be um, any uh, sockeye fisheries for gillnet fishery at the mouth of Skeena. But in the NAS, uh, they're just, they're working on finalizing it. They're looking at either the last week of June or the 1st of July for the gillnet opening for NAS sockeye. And in terms of seine fisheries, that's usually more targeting the uh, pink salmon. Uh, they will open fisheries in season and either keep them open or close them depending on the number of fish that are coming back. And those pink salmon, it usually starts in later, kind of mid to late July. So that's when the, most of the pink salmon start coming through. Okay, one more question from Noel and then we'll head over to the questions in the chat here. So uh, he says, when you would uh, say adapt your diet to the stronger stocks, which do you recommend targeting? Also, do you have any recommendations to find information on halibut and ling cod stocks? Yeah, okay. So, um, well, we, I mean, it's, it's, it, you have to look at each system because, for example, in the Skeena, Coho haven't been doing as well in the last few years, but in the NAS, they've been doing fine. So, I mean, if you're fishing in the NAS, then I think Coho would be a good target stock. Whereas in the Skeena, you might, you know, not saying don't fish for coho, but maybe don't kill as many, for example, or the same with Chinook. Um, whereas the, re the Chinook return in the NAS is looking okay, so taking your limit is more appropriate there. Uh, of course, pink salmon generally, generally have been doing all right, although in the last few years it's been low. But so what's important is looking at the numbers in season. And, and seeing because we you know I can give generalities right now but we really won't know until you know in, into July right in terms of well how many schnook are coming back and in early July we should have an understanding and if 
And if the runs are looking good, then why not, you know, harvest some fish? If they're looking even lower than what we're expecting, then then that's when you should consider uh, laying back, you know, not trying not to harvest as many. Great. Uh, so a question from Norm, Norm here. Uh, Nastinuk looks average, but Skeena is low. Is that a factor of in-river or ocean survivals? Yeah, we don't, the, the short answer is we don't know. Um, one, one of the things that's been going on lately is uh, generally across the coast, uh, the Chinook, they're called ocean type Chinook that generally only spend two to five months in the river. They've on average been doing better than the Chinook that spend one to two years in the river. So, um, you know, in terms of the NAS, I, you know, they do have quite a few ocean sh type Chinook, I think, in the NAS. So that may be, may be one of the reasons, but this, you know, we, the science hasn't been done to really uh, have a definitive answer on that. I think that's an open question. Great. Uh, question from uh, Alessandro. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Uh, there is, I think this is a question. Is there any serious analysis of the economic impact of sport fishing versus commercial? Uh, there are studies that have been done which look at the economic contributions from each of those fisheries uh, provincially. So there's, there's data on, you know, the contributions from commercial fisheries to the, pro, to the provincial economy versus sport fishing. Here in the region, there was a study done in 2009 by the commissioned by the Pacific Salmon Foundation, which looked uh, specifically at the North Coast re region and Skeena in particular. So of course that information is out of date now, but uh, gives some indication of the contributions from each. I know that the Terrace Area Angling Guides, the Skeena Angling Guide Association, hired an economist, I think a couple of years ago, and they uh, did some economic analysis on the, the lower river sport fishery. Um, so I think that information might be available as well, although I haven't seen a, a report there, but uh, we, could, we could look for it. Um. I actually do have a copy of that and we could we could post it um, maybe if you're interested uh, Alessandro uh, maybe just fire us an email uh, and we'll we'll happily pass that along um, another question here uh, from Edward uh, what's the mortality rate like on the boxes for the gillnet rescues and is there any idea on the ubiquity of non-compliance by fishers yeah so the blue box um, there was a lot of studies done in the kind of mid 1990s on looking at revival success in the blue boxes and it did there were um you know the, there was significant evidence to show that it did improve survivability of the fish bec because it gave them a chance to re to uh revive before they were put back in the ocean and and uh get their gills working again and also uh it has an impact on whether or not they can escape predators more easily you know if a fish is kind of banged up and then released right into the ocean and there's a seal there. Well, uh, that's easy, um, easy pickings, but uh, when they've been released in a blue box, it gives them a better chance. Uh, it, I don't have the, the exact, I'll have to do some digging to try to find some of those old numbers because I, I can't remember them offhand in terms of the difference. Um, but it depended, again, it depended a lot on how well the handling was of those fish. So if they were, you know, carefully taken out of the net and put in those blue boxes and then uh, the water was running properly and everything and then they were released properly back into the ocean, then uh, it, did, it did definitely help. But I don't, I don't have the, any um, specifics on, on those numbers. So I can look those up. And then uh, I think the other part of the question was on compliance in commercial fisheries with uh, doing the 
using the blue boxes and stuff like that. And uh, in the past, there has been issues with with the program, um, and that speaks to the importance of compliance and monitoring, and ensuring that having patrols and people out there making sure that fishermen are following the rules. That's an ongoing challenge due to um, just the, the resources and capacity. Uh, I will say, however, that the gillnet fishery, for example, on the North Coast is, uh, is really small compared to what it used to be. Um, you know, in a lot of years, it hasn't even opened in the mouth of the Skeena, for example, in recent years. And there's only been fairly small fisheries at the mouth of the Nass. So those, those fish are having impacts on other fish that they're bycatching, like Chinook and Steelhead. And, but um, it's, it's, it's pretty low now because the fisheries aren't, aren't uh, there's not a lot of fisheries happening they're, they're not getting very many days out there a far greater impact now in my you know from what i can from the numbers i've seen is is the fisheries in southeast alaska that intercept salmon headed to the skeena nass and other north coast systems Great. Uh, one last question here from Brad West. Uh, do you advise releasing all hens when fishing salmon as a conservation measure? Yeah, I mean, so the hens are, for those that don't know, that's the females with all the eggs. And um, yeah, I mean, big, generally, you know, with Chinook, um, it's it's kind of nice to be able to release those large females because they do carry a lot of eggs and uh try to release them i mean it's it's so i myself have done, done that quite often in the past but um it's sometimes not everybody knows the difference between a male and a female and um you know for species like sockeye and and coho i don't think it it's as big of a deal but um yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea for species like Chinook, especially the, the big females. Uh, but you, of course, you know, if you're gonna release a fish, you wanna make sure it's in good condition too, uh, or else uh, if it's really bleeding or beat up bad, then uh, if you're gonna kill a fish, you might as well kill the one that's beat up. Great. Um... If you were master of the universe, Greg, <laughs> and could fix one issue to help salmon, which would it be? Habitat, climate change, or fishing pressure? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, sometimes I pretend to be master of the universe, but it's not always helpful. Um, which issue? Well, I would climate change. It's, um, it's really having the biggest impact on our salmon right now and is the scariest thing going forward. Biggest uncertainty we have. Uh, as I pointed to, it's having impacts in both the ocean and fresh water for our salmon. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the big one. The climate always changes, but the scale and pace at, at which it's changing now is is very concerning. Um, so that would be the one I choose. I would choose, and then the second one, actually, which isn't listed here, I would try to fix the um, just the massive amount of hatchery releases and try to get some sort of international agreement on that to limit the amount of releases going into the North Pacific. Because you know, if you if you took out the hatchery proportion, then our salmon would probably be doing a lot better uh, right now our wild salmon. Um, the other thing I would say is that what I've seen is that salmon are incredibly resilient. So even with climate change and, and all the pressures we're putting on them, they are doing fairly well considering. So uh, it's pretty impressive as you learn, as I learn more about the different impacts and how many roadblocks we're putting in their way, it's pretty impressive that they're doing as well as they are. And it speaks to the fact that they're incredibly resilient and adaptive. And uh, an example of that is we're seeing them already change here in the region. You know, uh, 
occupying new habitat where glaciers have melted from in recent years, uh, changing their spawning locations to, to key in on the type of uh, cold water conditions and that they need. Uh, uh, a specific example is uh, Strone Creek, in, that is a tributary, large tributary in Mesiaden Lake in the NAS system. And uh, it used to be that um, Hannah and Tintina Creeks were the main sockeye spawning areas in Mesiaden Lakes and the big producers in the NAS system. And that's changed in the last few years. Uh, and we've seen a lot more sockeye sp spawning in uh, Strone Creek. So uh, we think it's, most people think it's just they're adapting to climate change, that water's becoming more conducive to spawning for them. And uh, we've also seen salmon moving into new habitats in the Arctic. And overall, the number of salmon in the ocean today is, uh, is as high as it's ever been. So um, those fish, they're just, they're just changing their habits. It's, but it is more challenging for the more Southern uh, populations, especially in Washington, Oregon, California, British Columbia, because the um, climate change is uh, taking them into, uh, the, it's just drier areas and the temperatures, you know, once you get up 18, 20 degrees, you can have serious impacts on salmon. So uh, in their southern ranges, they're having more, more challenges. But even in southeast Alaska now, they're seeing issues and uh, in terms of Chinook it's uh, really uh, all along the whole west coast of North America they're having some challenges with Chinook. Mm -hmm. Well uh, thanks Greg. Um, so before we wrap up today um, I just wanted to put it all uh, put it on everyone's radar that um, if you uh, enjoyed today's webinar we are going to be trying to do more of them and we have scheduled coming up Tuesday May 26th at noon and Thursday May 28th at 7 p.m. we'll be doing another webinar series Skeena Salmon and Climate Change so we'll be diving a little bit deeper into the climate change component. Um, and then Tuesday, oh, and on that webinar, our science director, Mike Price, uh, will be um, presenting uh, with Greg. And so he will be bringing uh, in some of the research that he's currently doing as part of his PhD. Uh, and that will be very interesting. And then Tuesday, June 9th and Thursday, June 11th, um, Tuesdays at 12 p.m., Thursday at 7 p.m., we'll be doing a webinar on uh, Mike Price's, again, our science director, Mike Price's um, PhD work specifically, uh, and it's focused on understanding the changes in abundance and diversity of wild salmon populations in the Skeena over the last century. It's incredibly interesting. He does an, an incredible job of, um, of explaining uh, his research and findings, um, and it, this information is, is really important. Um, in uh, for conservation scientists and resource managers, you know, um, to to reveal the extent and loss over the last century and and helps to make management decisions um, and help in the efforts um, for uh, recovery initiatives um, and rebuilding initiatives. So that uh, don't miss that. Um, stay tuned on our Facebook page. We'll be we'll be posting information about how to register for those webinars. Um, and actually, before we uh, wrap up there's one more question hi this is a big question okay um any any resources on climate change for our region that is something we should read or follow so maybe what i'll do um is maybe because we are at the end of of today's webinar maybe we could focus on this uh question in the in the upcoming webinar um and we can also follow up with you after the webinar tonight um, to discuss this issue just because we are, people are starting to sign off now. Um, yeah. How does that sound, Greg? That sounds good. I just add that uh, we will be, um, there will be a recorded version of this or the one on, that we did on Tuesday posted onto social media that you can also share or look back on if you want. Um, there is some, recordings, older recordings of presentations I've done on salmon and climate change 
on our Facebook page. So if you go to the video section, you can find that there. But yes, I will be giving an updated version of that in two weeks time. Mm -hmm. And so that will uh, provide a lot of this information because that is a really big question. And as part of that, um, we will um, we'll provide some, some materials to uh for you to read and to to follow up on and, and to follow um that's a that's a great suggestion for um how to strengthen our, our next webinar so thanks for that i've just launched our final poll just uh getting a little bit of feedback from you about your thoughts on today's webinar we're hoping like i said to be doing more of these in the future and so your feedback your ideas and thoughts are valuable to us, and as I mentioned at the outset of this webinar, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have additional questions. Uh, you know, nagging question in the middle of the night, you just need to need to ask. Send uh, send us an email, um, and our obviously our office is is closed right now due to COVID. We're all working from home, so email is the the best way to get in touch. Um, yeah, and I just add if you have any specific comments or feedback about the webinar, please uh, feel free to send those to us. We are always appreciate feedback and trying to make these sorts of things better. Yeah, and uh, thanks again to all of you for taking the time um, and caring deeply about Skeena Salmon. Um, your participation is a good indication that uh, we can we can all work together to improve their, their fate. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks everyone.